The Beatles are back. No, I don't mean in 2023. I'm talking about 1995. The Beatles Anthology was an eight-part TV series, followed by three albums containing 155 previously unreleased tracks, and was Beatles fans' biggest event of a generation. I'm Andrew from Parlogram, and in this video, we're going to be looking at the album Now and Then Should Have Been On, as we reveal the stories and secrets of the Beatles Anthology 3. The release of this album, Anthology 1, on November the 20th, 1995, was for me the most exciting Beatles album I'd ever bought. Its success, along with the Free as a Bird single and the accompanying TV series, ushered in a wave of 60s nostalgia. Not just in music, but also in fashion and popular culture. With first-generation fans turning 50 and second-generation fans like me already hooked, it was the perfect moment to create a new generation of Beatles fans. And just as the Red and Blue albums had been for me, Anthology became the new gateway into Beatles music for that new generation. The foundations for this Beatles revival had been laid a year previously, in November 1994, with the release of the long-awaited Live at the BBC album. Its success proved to Apple and EMI that the public were still in love with the Beatles and gave them the encouragement and confidence to press full steam ahead with the anthology project. Don't forget that aside from the Hollywood Bowl and BBC albums, official Beatles releases had, since Let It Be in 1970, been little more than cash grab repackages of their hits. The last of which being the well put together but unsuccessful Real Music in 1982 followed in 1988 by the more intelligent but only slightly more successful Past Masters. Apple's plan to present the Beatles with their trousers off, as John might have put it, was at the time a real gamble. Although it was something dedicated collectors had long been calling for, the big question was how would the public outside that dedicated fan base react to a bunch of lo-fi demos, early live performances and alternative versions of their hits. However, sales were huge right off the bat, and Anthology 1 sold 855,000 copies in its first week in the US and was certified triple platinum after six. In the UK, however, despite Pete Best calling it the Beatles' greatest album ever, Anthology was held off the top spot by the biggest selling album of the year which was an album of granny-pleasing 1960s cover versions by a lightweight acting duo called Robson and Jerome, which ironically included their cover of the Beatles' own song, This Boy. The release of Anthology 1 had been timed to coincide with the premiere of the TV series, which set the whole world once again talking about the Beatles. Anthology 2 appeared five months later in March 1996, although it and its lead-off single Real Love didn't generate the same degree of publicity as Anthology 1 and Free as a Bird, it managed to do what that album hadn't and reach number one in both the US and the UK. Covering the period from February 1965 to February 1968, Anthology 2 contained some incredible pieces of music from their most innovative period and was more critically acclaimed than Anthology 1. However, its lead-off single, Real Love, couldn't match Free as a Bird's success and just crept into the US Top 10 and only made number 4 in the UK. If you want to discover more about the making of Anthology 1 and 2, check out our dedicated in-depth videos about those elsewhere on the channel, links to which are in the description. Anthology 3 was released on October the 28th, 1996, almost a year after Anthology 1, by which time the presses and to a large extent the public's interest had waned. 
However, the strength of the material on it made sure it reached the top spot in the US, but disappointingly, it only managed number four in the UK. Although it contained 50 fascinating, high-quality tracks from many people's favourite period, it lacked the one thing the other two anthologies had, a newly recorded lead-off single. Originally, the plan was to record three new tracks, one for each anthology. But, as you surely know by now, work on Now and Then was scrapped partway through, which left Apple with a major problem. In the end, they chose to open Anthology 3 with a track called A Beginning. A Beginning was an instrumental piece which had been composed and scored by George Martin on July the 22nd, 1968, using the same orchestra that had appeared on the White Album track Good Night. But despite sounding like it was made for that track, A Beginning was actually intended as an introduction to Don't Pass Me By. And while never appearing on record before, it had been used as an incidental cue in the Yellow Submarine film. The first CD, or three sides of the vinyl of Anthology 3, are made up from material recorded between May to October 1968, the highlight of which being seven demo recordings made at George Harrison's home on his Ampex four-track reel-to-reel tape recorder in May 1968. These demos had been mixed into mono by George, after which copies had been given to each Beatle. They first came to light in the late 1980s as part of the Lost Lennon Tapes radio series and had entered general circulation by the early 1990s. Other highlights of that first CD were Step Inside Love, Lost Paranoias from the I Will session on September the 16th, along with a Hey Jude rehearsal and a number of other tracks from the White Album sessions. Although this White Album Deluxe box set released in November 2018 contained many previously unreleased tracks, Anthology 3 contains 16 White Album related tracks which are unique to it. For example, one of the album's finest moments is George's acoustic version of While My Guitar Gently Weeps, which on this White Album box set is an incomplete, interrupted take. Anthology 3 is the only source for the original 1968 recording without the later overdubs of the Love Album. The second CD, or sides four to six of the vinyl, cover recordings made between January 1969 to January 1970. Now my research for this video has uncovered a rare Abbey Road document, which contains an early track listing for that final CD, with notes by Jeff Emmerich. So let's go through that second disc track by track and compare it with this list, which I'll reveal as we go along. 1969. Track one on this list is the same as the one which opens up CD two or side four of the vinyl, I've Got a Feeling, which was taken from the first day of recordings made at Savile Row on January the 22nd. The sheet notes that the track breaks down with John's comment, which was about cocking it up trying to get loud. After which, a note in pencil reads, Redo Pops, which I assume means the microphone pops. This is followed on the sheet by All I Want Is You, Dig A Pony, from the same day, after which is noted the word Review. This appeared as track three on the released album. Another recording from that same day, Bathroom Window, is listed next, along with the words, slower than the master, after which is written the word lackluster. This track ended up as track two on the released album. Track three on the sheet, On Our Way Home, Two of Us, ended up as track four on the album and is dated as being from January the 24th. Track four on the sheet is Paul's Teddy Boy, also from January the 24th, and is followed by the instruction Redo. This appeared on Anthology as track six. Number five on this sheet has been crossed out, but it's clear that it was Dig It from January the 24th, after which was written quite different if rough. It was rough because this was the first day that track had been attempted. The 51 second version included on the Let It Be album was taken from the longer 15 minute jam recorded on January the 26th. In the end, no version of the song made it onto the released Anthology 3. 
Track six on the sheet is take one of George's For You Blue, with its original vocal from January the 25th. The note written after says, very like master, with not sure in bold after that. In fact, the album master used a re-recorded vocal done by George on January the 8th, 1970. This take one version wound up as track five on Anthology 3. Track seven on the sheet matches that of the album, which was the Rock and Roll Jam from January the 26th. It's noted on the sheet as being very rough and I don't think we can use it. Needs to be pruned if used at all. Well, pruned it was as Kansas City, Miss Anne and Lordy Miss Claudie were cut for the release medley and replaced by Rip It Up. Tracks eight and nine on this list match the album, which were The Long and Winding Road from January the 26th and Oh Darling from the 27th, which is marked as Redo. Track 10 on this sheet isn't All Things Must Pass as it is on the album, but Mailman Bring Me No More Blues from January the 29th. Track 11 here is Get Back from the Rooftop, which is marked as performance number three, and described as rough but historic, being the performance done when the police were breaking in. This was track 12 on the CD. The sheet then proposes that Let It Be from January the 31st is used, but is marked as Redo. In the end, however, they selected an earlier recording from January the 25th, to which they added two pieces of dialogue by John from the January the 31st session. Tracks 13, 14 and 15 on the sheet are all George's demos, which are followed by a large question mark. But despite this, they all thankfully ended up being used on the album, although not altogether. Track 16 is listed as Maxwell's Silver Hammer, the first vocal from July the 9th. The handwritten note states, good mix, pull back out of tune words. This appeared as track 15 on the released album. But there was no place on the original running order for Ringo's Octopus's Garden. One, two, one, two, three, four. Come Together is track 17 on this sheet and on the released album. This was take one from July 21st, which was rather unkindly marked as being lackluster. Track 18 on the sheet is John's croaky rendition of Ain't She Sweet from July the 24th, which became track 19 on the album. Paul's demo for Badfinger of Come and Get It from the same day is next, after which Jeff has written which version should be Sessions, a reference to the mix he'd already done for the cancelled 1985 album of that name. Because is track 20 both on the sheet and the album, which of course is the beautiful voices only version from August the 1st. Track 21 here is the version of I Me Mine, recorded on January the 3rd, 1970, on tape E91742, Mix Take 16, which is prefaced by George's speech about Dave D, Mickey and Titch, after which is the instruction to check against the Glyn Johns mix, to which Jeff has added, we'll check. The final track here, and on Anthology 3, was unsurprisingly the end from Abbey Road. After the end of the end in the final episode of the series, the film goes to Paul, George and Ringo chatting round Paul's kitchen table before finally ending with a video for Free as a Bird. As is evident from this sheet, the producers wanted to create an effective ending, not just for this album, but for the entire anthology. On the released album, after the end has ended, the final piano chord from A Day in the Life fades up backwards and into its opening note, and then fades out again. But the idea proposed here was slightly different. What they originally wanted to do is to re-record the orchestra used on the end in order to, quote, make a bigger finish. One of the reasons for re-recording it was that despite it originally being a decent sized orchestra in 1969, that consisted of 12 violins, four violas, 
four cellos, one string bass, four horns, three trumpets, one trombone and a bass trombone, all costing EMI an equivalent today of nearly £10,000. It had, for some extraordinary reason, only been recorded in mono. Now this new, beefed up stereo orchestral piece would then be followed by a new piano chord, played in a similar way to that of A Day in the Life, only that it would be in the key of A to match that of the end. The plan was then to film Paul, George and Ringo playing it together. In the end though, it didn't happen. But maybe it would have made a more interesting ending than a wink from Paul. So, is Anthology 3 still worth owning today? Well, while it's true that it did take some liberties with some of its tracks by making mixes from different takes, I'm happy to overlook that. After all, the set was mainly all about entertainment and listenability rather than total accuracy. 30 out of 50 tracks, or 60%, are unique to Anthology 3. And with minimal dithering or noise reduction applied to the fade-outs, it's a great sounding album. The vinyl is well mastered and the CD is not limited or brick walled. The original vinyl pressing was decent, although it's not cheap these days, and an original European pressing will set you back an easy 100 euros or dollars. My copy here is a 2017 pressing from the Di Agostini mail order series, which in my opinion is much better value and half the price. It was recut by Sean McGee at Abbey Road from Digital Masters, but in truth, there's very little to choose sound-wise between the original and this. Also, the Diagostinis were pressed by MPO in France on much heavier 180 gram vinyl. If you're not sure what exactly the Diagostini series was, check out a link to our video about it in the description. Although the contents of this album bowled everybody over back in 1996, it doesn't compare with the depth and selection of the more recent archive box sets. But it does contain some real gems which are not included on those box sets, and I think it should be an essential part of anyone's Beatles collection. Looking ahead, it's high time the Anthology TV series was remastered into 4K or on Blu-ray, and updated with new footage, such as some of the 14 hours of 1990s footage of the sessions of Paul's studio that Peter Jackson was supplied with when he was making the Now and Then video. And who knows what else Apple have locked away. Indeed, I found it quite disheartening hearing Peter Jackson in a recent interview allude to the fact that even staff at Apple are unaware of exactly what they have in their vaults. Peter Jackson would be the perfect person to be let loose on this project, which I think would be ultimately more rewarding than the Star Club tapes. Anyway, Let's see what happens. I, for one, would be happy to lend a hand. I really hope you enjoyed taking a close look at this album. And if you like what we're doing, please do consider supporting us by either liking, subscribing, or even becoming a channel member. It all helps to keep the channel going. Also, why not check out our website, parlogramauctions.com, where we'll be uploading lots of Beatles and 60s goodies during the next few weeks. I'll be back next week with some more Beatles fun. But I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching. I cocked it up trying to get loud. Yeah. Not bad though.